Tonight on Joy News Prime, police at Akuman detained two young men accused of attempting to arrest, uh, to detain or kidnap a four year old Wednesday afternoon. Lord, so, yeah, you were Madina. Na abaku se ni ni yangu o wa madina no yo sofu na o mu se akwala no eh eh ye kan se sun sun bi ha ni ti no anka o mu break ya ma no no se ah mi a mi di mi ba mi hu se sun sun na mu ni mi se ni papa ni mi na mi ni mo kasa no se suspects including three police officers and a rural bank manager are remanded into custody in connection with the death of a suspect in police custody prosecutor Superintendent Joseph Apalu said an autopsy conducted on the body of the deceased gave the cause of death as chest injury and blunt trauma to the chest. The Manutown residents drawing water from dugouts and gutters say they are compelled by the acute water shortage in the area. <laughs> We'd hear from the Ghana Water Company in business, a boost for Ghana's automotive industry as to trade Mr. Oping's showroom of latest vehicle assembling firm, Zonda Tech. And a member of the Supreme Court panel that heard the 2020 election petition has justified the decision to dismiss it. When the petition was filed, the results of the presidential election at the Chiman South had already been announced and the results had been certified. So we had to use the appropriate figures. And when we used the appropriate figures, we saw that it gave the second respondent a percentage of 51.259%. My name is Israel and Johnny is Prime is coming to you live from our final four studios at Kokumlimli here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air and also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. This is the home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Do stay tuned in. Now, first story, a member of the Supreme Court panel which had the 2020 election petition has defended the dismissal of the NDC flag breast petition. The Apex Court in March said John Dramani Mahama failed to prove that no candidate got more than 50% of the votes cast and therefore affirmed the declaration of Nana Kufado as outright winner of the presidential poll. The former president, however, criticized the ruling. I believe that the refusal of the Electoral Commission chairperson to testify in this election petition leaves a very bad precedent for the future. I disagree with the suggestions of our justices that an election petition is akin to any other civil litigation and therefore an EC chairperson whose functions go to the heart of our democracy can by a legal slate of hand avoid accounting for her stewardship in an appropriate forum such as the highest court of the land. Our legal team, led by Mr. Chachuchikata, put together our case in a clear manner, which left no one in doubt about the issues that were at stake. Apart from seeking to ensure compliance with the Constitution and for the true choice of the people of Ghana to be respected, the petition sought to provide opportunity for transparency and accountability in the management of our electoral process. But no one who followed the proceedings of the Supreme Court will be surprised with the judgment pronounced a few hours ago. Much as I'm aware that we are legally bound by the decision of the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of Ghana, I disagree with the process of the trial and the ruling of the court. Speaking at a high-level stakeholders forum to review the 2020 polls and its aftermath, Justice Gertrude Tokono said the court's calculation when dealing with the election petition showed that the EC chairperson only made an error during her declaration and that President Tekufado got more than 50% of the votes cast. Based on the data, the data in the declaration of the first respondent 
The second respondent got more than 50%. Uh, holding is that there's no doubt that in providing particulars of the vote cast, the chairperson of the first respondent announced a figure 13 million four three four five seven four, which was referring to total valid votes cast which was in actually 13 million one two one 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 one. So the video sent to us showed that she had said that on, after she had listed all the valid votes for each candidate, she had said on the premise of the total vote cast, the, these people got these percentages. And, and so it was a case of the petitioner that if she had said total vote cast, then the court should use the total vote cast to recalculate the percentages. So the petitioner questioned the validity of the declaration, and we said, yes, she had made an error in describing the total votes as total valid votes, because there are different figures. But from the evidence on the record, you, it could be seen that the petitioner would, had built his case around the figure of 30 million 434 that had been erroneously announced as the total valid votes cast. But the evidence also showed that after, the, after she de detected the error in announcing the figure of 30 million votes before as a total valid vote, the error was corrected the next day in the press release. Clearly, the petitioner recognized that the total valid votes were 30 million 121 and not 30 million 434 574. And on the basis of that, from all the evidence, there's no legal basis for anyone to contend that a different figure of 13 million, 434, should be used as the total valid vote. So it was all about those words. In measuring more, the more effect in instruments, that the is prima facie evidence. And so we look at the legal import of that constitutional direction of prima facie evidence. And using Article 297 and Section 22 of the Interpretation Act, we appreciated that if a public officer corrects their mistake, it is supported by law, because this is what Section 22 provides. Where an enactment confers a power or imposes a duty on a person to do an act or thing, of an administrative or executive character or to make an appointment, the power may be exercised or performed in order to correct an error or omission in a previous exercise. So we were of the considered opinion that the correction was appropriate. Now, one major issue of concern that came up during the polls was the claim of vote padding by the NDC. But Justice Stokono said the NDC should have brought pink sheets to back that claim. So issue three was whether or not the second respondent still had reached the 50% threshold with the inclusion of Techim and Sal. And on a review of that, we said it is important to say that at the time the petition was filed, the results of the presidential election at Techim and Sal had already been announced and the results had been certified. So we had to use the appropriate figures. And when we used the appropriate figures, we saw that it gave the second respondent a percentage of 51.259%. Issue 5 was whether or not that there was alleged, there was a vote padding, because an, some allegation had been put in the petition about vote padding. And it, it was supposed to concern 5,662 votes in 32 constituencies. But in the wrong aggregation of votes, totally 960. But on the exhibit F that was brought to court, there was a spreadsheet alleging vote padding of 4,693 votes in 26 constituencies. And so we said we, we would have expected that the pink sheets of those polling stations would have been exhibited to prove the allegation instead of a spreadsheet. The conclusion was that even if one took out these 4,693 votes, uh, it would not impact on the 6 million uh, plus votes that the candidates were dealing with. The Supreme Court judge also put out what is expected from justices who will sit on future petitions. So we concluded with what is a direction to courts when it comes to uh, election petitions. A threefold duty.
that had been first enunciated in the English case of Morgan and Simpson, which we found useful to adopt. That if the election was, and so it would be useful for political players to appreciate that any election petition would look at this threefold uh, duty. If the election was conducted so badly that it was not substantially in accordance with the law at the elections, the election is initiated. So our summary was that we initiated this principle that an election would be voided upon the occurrence of infractions that actually affect the votes of the citizens cast at the polling stations and not the incidence of administrative errors or mistakes committed by officers charged with the conduct of such election, unless those errors or mistakes affect the results. So this is a quote from Adinyura JSC that we ended the petition with. Um, courts usually apply the election code to protect, not to defeat the right to vote, but public policy favors salvaging the election and giving effect to the voters' intent. Consistently, we are looking for the voters' intent. What did the voters vote? How did they vote? What, what, what were the valid votes? If you can identify the valid votes, then that is what the courts are interested in. Right, so this event, or the justice was speaking at a review of the 2020 election, and there were several CSOs that were there, including Codeo. And uh, we have on the line the acting chairperson of Codeo, Sheikh Aramea. Thank you very much for making time to speak with us, uh, Sheikh Aramea. So a lot has been said over the period that you have been deliberating over the 2020 election. Would you say this exercise has been useful? I mean, uh, definitely. Um, it, has, it was a very useful exercise uh, in terms of the, the quality of the members of the panel for discussion that came and the depth, the, the discussion, the commitment and the passion uh, with which uh, panel members discussed uh, the issue. In fact, I would say without any fear of contradiction, as I stated in my um, welcome remarks, uh, the idea is to learn, the discuss, learn the lessons, and such lessons as will inform and guide recommendations that will help uh, enhance and improve uh, the future of elections um, in Ghana. And uh, throughout the two and a half days that we have been at uh, ADA, uh, that has been our engagement and uh, I will say that uh, um, we really achieved our, our, our result, and I hope that um, we, as part of our um, um, this, this decision, we intend to put a, a certain kind of um, um, a committee of CSOs and other state organizations to push forward some of the recommendations that has, co has come out uh, from the, the workshop. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we have done. All right. Now, what are some of the issues that came out of the deliberations? Yeah, I mean, uh, among the issues, we, we considered matters of um, security elections, uh, security of elections, uh, and, it's, uh, and management of, of, of results is one of the areas uh, that we... Uh, because um, if you were abreast with the... The, the problems that emanated from the declaration of results uh, and the court issues, you will notice that a lot came out um, related to how the results were, were declared um, and, and the misgivings that the uh, political party affected, you know, the petitioning uh, or the petitioner uh, took to court mean, meant that in the process of declaration, there were some issues. So we tried to look at that and understand. Uh, you notice that's why we brought um, her leadership to Kono uh, to come and talk, talk to us. We also look at issues of security. For example, um, you notice that we noticed that in the process of election, almost everything was smooth until it came to matters of collation. So a collation, all the tiers of collation are issues that we thought that uh, security need to be tightened up ar around the centers of coalition, i.e., um, the constituency coalition centers, regional coalition centers, and indeed even the national coalition centers. All these areas, because of the crowd, overcrowding around this place, 
um, it did not allow the calmness and the peace that will allow a more efficient work uh, to be done. So that security threat there was an issue. And then also we also look at uh, the, the cost of uh, political campaigning um, and, and, and how it contributes to the corruption of our ele- uh, election system or the corruption of our political system, uh, how it's, it undermines political integrity um, and so on. So it's also one of the things that we, we considered and we, we, we think that uh, something needs to be done about it. Then also, we look at the, the work of the Electoral Commission itself, um, um, the, the, the conduct of election itself and, and challenges that have has emanated uh, some of the areas also that we we we, we considered um, these and others as uh, the the issues that we consider and I think that they affect all the dimensions of our election and uh, in fact we also considered the role of the media. Um, Evans Spencer was there and he gave a, a very excellent pre- presentation about uh, the work of, of the media, uh, the. Uh, uh, media for uh, foundation for for media in West Africa uh, also also gave some some presentation um, as to um, how the media could play a role in ens- ensuring that uh, we had a very smooth uh, election. There was the the, the challenge about um, who to call election first and the contestation among media houses as to. Uh, who wants to come out first and call right. and call the, 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 the election? That was also a matter um, for us to discuss, so that we avoid the the rush, the rush to come out uh, pronouncing election results when we are not very sure about uh, certain things. However, um, for the media houses that called the election, all of them were of the view that they had their figures right and they they were very sure. Uh, about the results that they, 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 they give. All right, these, Sheikh, these are some of the issues that, that we All right, Sheikh, what are some of the recommendations uh, that have been made to improve our elections going forward? Yeah, I mean, uh, though the recommendations have not come out um, in, in a formal way that I can, I can reach to you, but just the highlights of, um, some, of, the, some, of the, some, some of the issues. All right. Um, recommendations... One of them are, are, are that um, the, the, EC, the EC must show responsibility in enforcing um, electoral laws um, that has to do with, uh, with uh, political parties. For example, um, the declaration of the, their, their account and, and uh, clear regulation that has to do with nomination uh, of uh, candidates or the disqualification of, of candidates. I mean, these are things that we said uh, EC must come out with that one clearly. And then also regulations regarding um, declaration of results or the correction of declared results uh, is also something um, that we recommended that it, it needs to be made clear. Um, um, the issue of the transmission of of elections from polling stations to um, to coalition centres, uh, constituency coalition centres, and to regional coalition centres, we have recommended another tier that an each el- there must be a coalition centre for each electoral area. So that tier will mean that EC will need some more resources to create that level, so that we reduce the congestion at the constituency coalition centre, and also reduce the congestion at the regional coalition coalitions. Um, Center. All right. Um, these were the some of the um, recommendations, re- recommendations uh, right. that have um, uh, come out from from the discussion. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Karumi Al Shaibu, who is the uh, acting chairman of Kodeo. You're watching Joy News Prime. Still ahead in the bulletin, police at Dakuman detained two young men accused of attempting to kidnap a four-year-old Wednesday afternoon. No, so yeah, yeah, well, Madina. Na aba ku se ni nua we o wa made na o yo sofo na o ma hu se akwala no eh eh ye kan se sun sun bi halud six suspects including three police officers and a rural bank manager remanded into custody in connection with the death of a suspect in police custody prosecutor superintendent joseph apalu said 
an autopsy conducted on the body of the deceased gave the cause of death as chest injury and blunt trauma to the chest. Stay tuned in, we'll be back in a bit. The police at Dakuman are holding two young men accused of attempting to kidnap a four-year-old girl Wednesday afternoon. The toddler, according to the father, had been sent to buy food in the company of a seven-year-old sister when the suspects, believed to be aged between 17 and 20, took her hostage. Maxwell Alowodo narrates how he chanced on what he believed was the attempt to kidnap his daughter when he decided to find out why the children had stayed away for an unreasonably long time. Timiye Jumana can say about two of Mohon, I'm so no. A young shim in Timiye, may be Fiena, maybe, may banam be sa. This small boy by good dinner, Chen and Bissan is a Nissan standing in your no more, or some more toy, dear. And I'm so okay. My ya worded Antony Mituka can I'm so any as I dear, my mind do much in a minquire day. Now I'm a question of all my chain. Timmy call and I'm sure boys me, you be a mukita, me bass small boy three years in the same or mukita in the same. And I'm Bissan was a ah. I, didn't know. I came home around 12 p.m. from work to check on my kids. But when I got home, they still hadn't returned, and so I went out to look for them. I saw two men holding my four-year-old daughter. I interrogated them and took my daughter from them. They kept saying things that did not add up. One of them eventually told me he was from Medina, and that was when I got alarmed. I called some neighbors and took him to the police station. Not to know Obinsu Eba, Timisha Nipano, Ira Guy, and Amisha and Gajans of Crachi, Buamina, BBC and a boys who are more yentino. Timicas and Uchi on no swimming church and Muchina, no Mukra de Cancer Umber Confisci Guy no, so Munimino has a sister, Timica Massenger and Gans Assembly Namican. They shall say to two to Manunia, they are no more two papa so sa. I feel they are not, I feel they are so on feed that come on having no Fimedina, no so what, Nedium Bar Police Station. The suspects, according to the grandmother of the child, Mary Ajumayi, were found in possession of human teeth, anointing oil, and other items, suggesting they were ritualists. No, so, yeah, you were Madina. Na, about who say, Nina, we were Madina, no, you're sofu, no, woman who say, Aqualano, eh, eh, you can say, soon, soon be hanging tin, and come over, break your man. No, say, ah. Me and me dimmy ba, me who said so so, now moon himself, ni papa name in a mini more casano. And she's tamano and no casano, no see, na, on unqua, almost we mean, to know who you want to preoccupy, no one say, every boy ba, cuba, and no catching and say, They told my son they are from Madina and they are pastors. The feather said they saw an evil spirit in the child and wanted to free her from the spirit. He got angry and didn't understand why they could say such a thing about his girl. He called some neighbors and together we brought them to the police station. The police found human teeth, cowries, oil and some herbs in their pockets. The police warned them to tell the truth or face punishment. I won't put him any China for we be a cahon. And now, only in the whole police in the case says a moment wicked pa, na moment can cry to my baby demon and yas and ketwa. The Dakuman police confirmed the two suspects are in custody, adding that the matter is being investigated. Elsewhere, an autopsy report conducted on the body of a man who died while in police custody appears to confirm claims by his family that he was brutalized to death. Three policemen stationed at the Sequa police station in the Bono region who were interdicted in connection with the death of 48-year-old Abu Nepa have now been charged with murder and have been remanded into police custody to reappear on May 11, 2021. Three other suspects, including Emmanuel Ofori, the Inkramang Rural Bank manager, who reported the destruction of the rear windscreen of his Toyota Highlander by the deceased, has also been remanded in custody with the death, in connection with the death. The family of Abu Bukhari say they are so far satisfied with a week, two weeks remand under the suspects, but that justice for their brother is what will ease the pain in their hearts. Abdul Rahman speaks for the family. <laughs> The family is happy about the process so far. 
We are hopeful that justice will be served. And the law should deal with the culprits. He dismissed rumors that the deceased who left behind three children was mentally unstable and neglected by the family. The reports that Abu is mentally unstable are not true. We're taking a break here on Journey's Prime. We're bringing you business news next. Stay tuned. Hello, good evening and welcome to business. Ghana is hopeful of becoming the automotive hub for Africa in the near future with a focus on industrial transformation. According to the Trade Minister, Alan Germantin, the entry of some key manufacturing firms into the country has boosted the country's policy drive towards the agenda. Mr. Germantin was speaking at a short ceremony to open the Accra branch of Zona Tech Limited, a special purpose vehicle and tracks assembly company in Ghana. The opening of the Zonda Tech Service Center and showroom is part of moves by the company to take advantage of the country's automotive development policies to expand its presence in Africa. Minister for Trade and Industry Alan Chermantin believes that the move will open up opportunities for many Ghanaians to be employed as part of the industrialization agenda. He hopes that Ghana will soon be the hub for the automobile industry in Africa, an agenda being pursued by government. So the start of the assembly industry in Ghana is pointing Ghana to a very bright future. And hopefully, in the very near future, we hope that Ghana will become the hub for the vehicle and automotive assembly, not only in West Africa, but on the whole continent of Africa. Meanwhile, the minister also hinted that government will reform the educational system to conform with the industrial need of the country. This, he thinks, will help to deal with the unemployment situation. We are also going to transform the content of our educational sector and the curriculum. Because if you consider all the industries that I've just been talking about, we need to align our education to provide the type of manpower resources that will feed into our industrial transformation agenda. So what we are doing here now is part of an integrated program for the transformation of our country. Managing Director of Zonda Tech Ghana, Madame Yang, said the company wants to get closer to more customers in its service delivery, hence the new showroom. We always say customer first, service foremost. So, you know, when the vehicles were sell to different parts of the country, we we'll want to establish a service center, a sales center there to come closer to our customers, to do our best service for them. That's why we always say Zunda the best. So, like in Tema, we have our headquarters. We see that in Accra, we also need one center there to get closer to customers. Then we have one in Eswam. Now we're building one in Kaswa. We have one in Takradi. We are building one in Kumasi, and we also have one in Tamani. So by doing all this, we are very close to our customers. Ebenezer Sabote's report for Joy Business.
Now, the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry has made the recovery of businesses its major priority. With COVID-19 crippling most businesses, President of the Chamber, Clement Osama Marco, says a policy proposal to governments to explore business recovery strategies is in the works. He spoke at the inauguration of the GNCCI Council of Elders. The focus of this council moving forward um, is that after conference, we will have to put in the council as um, we are established by Legislative Instrument 611 to put a council that will direct us into um, being focused into the future. And um, we also need their mandate in whatever that we do. So um, we have to bring them together today to inaugurate this council for that purpose. Some of the things that they do is that a lot of decisions that we take rest with the council. And so it's like we establish an institution without a head. And so according to our organogram, they head the entire chamber and then we are running it for them in their absence. And so we need to account to them and then make sure that whatever vision that the chamber has, we come to discuss with them, approve our budget for spending and other things that will help the country to grow. So that's the essence of this council today. Uh, they are being inaugurated on the back of COVID-19, the pandemic hitting businesses, also the continental future agreement area. What are your expectations from them? Yes, um, as we are, as a business entity, we are focused into the future. We know the constraint, that being the COVID, and what we have to do. Um, we only have to re-strategize because the world is moving at a very fast pace and then we cannot be left behind that because we have that constraint, COVID, and we are sitting down. We need to support our businesses and make sure that some directions of the government will look at it and address it with them. And so that they'll have a good atmosphere to do their businesses in the interest of the country. So we are not worried too much about the COVID. Life must go on. And the other ways of doing things now, we have a way of doing even most of our meetings through um, virtual and other activities are going on. And the world is moving, so we must move. And that's all we have for business. Sports is up next. Many thanks for staying with us. It's time to bring you the sports. My name is Hans Mensah and the Ghana Football Association president, Keto Kroko, believes the various national teams will be strong in a few years to come. Kurt made this comment when the Football Association launched the Juvenile League in Accra earlier today. My colleague Haruna Mubarak was there and comes through with his report. The date mooted for the start of the Juvenile League was last month in March. However, due to COVID-19 issues, government did not give the GFA the clearance to start. But now that the Juvenile League has been launched, it means competitions at the district level can start. Juvenile football was in existence in the previous years, but due to COVID-19, which has halted all sporting activities, really brought that particular competition to a halt. And also due to the eight children who died in that offensive accident in Kumasi in September last year. President of the Ghana Football Association, who doubles up as the head of the Juvenile Committee, expressed his delight in the return of the Juvenile League. He also added that the return of the league will ensure that the various national teams will be formidable. When we speak about the fundamentals, juvenile football is a key component of, of the fundamentals of, of association football. And if it is that we are not doing well at the youth level in recent times, it is because we've not placed too much emphasis on, on juvenile football and it is that time that we have to put in a lot more energy um, so that the kids get the right levels of tuition, get the right levels of logistics to be able to show their God-given talent um, and then from there they can make their progression as they, they climb the ladder. So juvenile football, like I said, is key. Uh, it is only from the juvenile leagues that super talents can go through the ladder or can go up the ladder for, for, for national selectors to, to, to take notice. And if it is that the juvenile leagues are strong, our national teams invariably will be strong, especially the juvenile level. And if you, if you cast your mind back, in the years that Ghana has done very well at the juvenile level, our blasters have been very strong. Okay, so I'm extremely expectant, I'm extremely happy, and um, I, I think that we are in the right way. Uh, we are pressing the right buttons uh, at the right time, in spite of the fact that we are in, a, we are in a, an extremely difficult period of COVID-19. I mean, it's, somebody will say it's no joke at all. 
to operate within this period. But we're pushing, we're pushing, and we, we, we're bringing along the industry step by step. Former Black Stars midfielder and a player who has risen through the ranks in close football is Lai Kinson. Now he shares the sentiment of Keto Kreku. It's very, very important. That's, that's what will produce uh, 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 likes of Asamoajans, likes of uh, Michaelisians, likes of all these top players, Stephen Apia, all these top players that Ghana have ever had, uh, the DIUs and all those people. So, so with that, it's, it's very, very important for us to focus more over there and then give them that support. And then we, in future, we can get those, those quality of players that we used to have. Juvenile League, we start on May 6th, has a different format. The winner at the district level will compete at the regional level. And the winner at the regional level will also compete at the national level. Now this particular competition is called the National Champions League. From the Ghana Football Association Secretariat and for Joy Sports, I am Haruna Mubarak. Let's get you quick updates from the UEFA Champions League game going on tonight. It's the first leg of the second semi-final Manchester City away at Paris Saint-Germain and it is PSG who have been dominant and deservedly up by a goal to nil. We'll bring you more later in the bulletin, of course, later at 10.30 p.m. on Fun Zone. That's it for now. My name is Hans Mensando. Time for showbiz. Becky Bex is here. Hello, Becky. Hello to you, Izzy. How you doing? Well, Yao well. Sapo is in the news. Okay. Oh, how is saying? How sweet. So, he has a new song out. Apparently, he had an accident uh, last year, uh, October last year, together with his crew members when they were heading to perform somewhere in Kumasi. And so, this particular song that has been released this new one you're new talking. one is just to show gratitude to god and he's hinted that uh, kofi kinata he has a song with kofi kinata okay. and it uh, will be coming soon let's listen to uncle yao my releasing new song i released a new song featuring kwesi jc titled acida last year i was involved in a ghastly accident but god delivered me and my crew that's why I released this song to express my profound gratitude to God for saving me. Also expect a new hit track from me featuring Kofi Kinata. I want my music to transform lives, so I plan to minister at churches. So when they say financier, what exactly do they mean? Uh, the meaning the person sponsoring or the executive producer, the person pushing in money. And I think that we should... When they push in that money, is the money they get back or...? Uh, well, we'd have to ask uh, Mr. Nanakobo uh, yeah. whether or not he's getting the back. Finance, but yeah. the fact that, I mean, he's supporting he is... Sometimes they just want to do it because they're supporting yeah. the gospel. The gospel. Yeah. I should, we should do some gospel music sometimes soon. And get, and get financiers. Financiers. <laughs> uh, good news for the movie industry because uh, there's a presidential pitch series that, you know, the movie industry is benefiting from. Right. Um, Juliet Asante is a movie producer and he, she explains to us exactly what uh, this is about. The government, through the National Film Authority, under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, has taken the charge to create an ecosystem that will encourage a vibrant marketplace for Ghanaian movies. This will help motivate the production of good Ghanaian movies that will find markets globally. The Presidential Pitch Series is a pipeline down the value chain intervention that addresses a huge gap in the system. It creates the marketplace for good ideas within the film ecosystem to align with the investment they need on one hand and the distribution on the other hand to help ensure a good return on investment. 
whilst reaching audiences in Ghana and globally. So this was uh, the launch which happened yesterday and we're hoping that uh, things will move smoothly so that the film industry will you bounce, know, bounce back. back. Yeah, we're going to see a lot more Ghanaian movies. Movies, you know, everywhere. When you go to London, you see, I want to travel back to London, but it, that's, that's not uh, why we're here. Why we're here, it's <laughs> because Stoneboy, so uh, he was supposed to have a a concert for his Angolonga Junction album. It's an anniversary, but he's postponed it. And there's a press release to that effect. Easy, let me read it for you and for our viewers. So it says that uh, the Benetton Music Group regrets to inform her esteemed fans and patrons that the slated to be held Angolonga Junction album anniversary virtual concert at the Bayview Village in Accra on the first. Uh, of this month has uh, of next month has been postponed uh, this unfortunate development is as a result of a combination of unforeseeable production hitches a new date of uh, 22nd may 2021 at the bayview village uh, has been scheduled for this important celebration Retreat event table reservations are still ongoing and so that's uh, the new one coming in by Stoneboy. We're hoping that Kerry will show up, you know, at the event. Really? Oh, she will show up. <laughs> could it, she was could, supposed could it be to the reason why, one of the reasons why it isn't postponed? I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure she couldn't make it, so All right. they decided thank, that. Thank you very much, uh, Becky Rex, for, for bringing us a uh, show base. Uh, we're taking uh, a break. We have a <laughs> Now, daily shortage of water is fast becoming the norm in part of the Tema metropolis, which have been battling the challenge for ages now. An announcement of cuts in the already staggered water supply by the Ghana Water Company Limited last week has worsened the situation. Residents in about eight affected communities are forced to either buy water from private suppliers at exorbitant prices or travel several kilometers to draw water from makeshift dugouts, gutters and burst underground pipes, damning the health implications. They want government to intervene immediately to deal with the situation. My colleague Manuel Coranting spent a day there in our report. Even though Ghana met the drinking water target for the Millennium Development Goals five years ahead of the 2015 deadline, access is still not uniform across the country. While rural areas are easily suspected to have the challenge, some residents in peri-urban areas are also affected. A typical example, Tema Newtown in the Tema metropolis and its environs. I bathed with only three cups of water this morning. There's no water here. They use the tricycles to get the water from other communities. The situation is even worse up the hill. According to the residents, this challenge, which has existed for years, only got worse after scheduled cuts in the already staggered supply from the Ghana Water Company Limited. This kinky seller's shop has been closed for days. The taps haven't been flowing for over a week now. I just want to buy these gallons of water. One costs one CD 50 pesos, so I couldn't even open my shop today. With gallons lined up in front of every household, tricycle riders are the biggest gainers of the situation. We supply the water at a charge. Today I've supplied more than 150 gallons. So when they call us, we go and pick them up. Oh, 
Um, kwa zibu wao kitabe 40 galams sibiki ta sisi but maka za ende kwa mburu wada zia kwa zana pekwa mchu nsi kwa machu nsi omuzi mwa 50 for those who cannot afford to pay, they travel several kilometers to fetch milky water from this dugout. It's like a gutter. It's been over a month since the taps were closed. For some weekends today, the water is no more coming where that's why it become like washing. Some to use to bath, but you cannot use it to cook because there is salt inside as well. And uh, this thing, there are small, small distant animals, bacteria inside. So that one you can use it to wash, but you cannot use it to cook. Since last two weeks, water has become a problem to us. And this is the place we have been washing. Some have been fetching water to their homes. Oh, the water is not clean, and we, are, we don't know where the water is coming from. Miami is one, Bankuman, Abonko, Awudum, B Park, Ju, Tu, and stars. Uh, it, it, it's very critical condition that we are facing right now. As in the, 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 the tab that they've closed, it's really giving us stress. And like, it, it's so difficult for us to get water, even to drink. So for drinking, we ought to uh, uh, buy the uh, sachet water, which is the pure water. And we boys boys like this, we are in one room. At times, we used to spend our while. 20 CDs in a day just for sachet water, drinking, not even for bathing. At times, we don't even bath for a day. This is the VACO, VACO uh, 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 company here, yeah. and like they, they have some some water gutter. It's even a gutter, not a clean water. Yeah, it's a gutter that we used to fetch to bath, and others too have been fetching it to their various home. For them, I don't know what they use it for. So this is the daily site here in Tema, but at least the Tema Newtown area where you have uh, the Valco Aluminium Smelting Company. Well, daily, the young and old throng to these gutters, makeshift wells and dugouts to be able to access some form of water for their daily needs. We know they spend so much on water that they drink, but until the Ghana Water Company Limited restores supply of water to their homes this is all they're left with reporting for joy news my name is manuel Cranting. we're hoping to speak with the ghana water company but we're unable to reach the communications manager as of now uh, the minority in parliament is alleging government interference in the publication of a nationwide load shedding timetable this, according to the opposition MPs, is because the publication would be an admission that the unreliable power supply problem is a nationwide problem. Ranking member of Parliament, Mines and Energy Committee, John Jinapo, who strongly believes the recent wave of power outages has to do with financing, also accused the MPP government of reversing the gains made by the Mahama administration in the energy sector. Here are excerpts of a news conference he addressed Wednesday. More recently, you would also recall that the Union of the Electricity Company of Ghana embarked on an industrial action demanding the removal of their managing director, citing incompetence, duplicity, and total lack of understanding of the power distribution company. Indeed, we've all witnessed a lot of agitation within the ECG. We are also picking similar signals at NETCO. There was a similar one at VRA where the union staff issued a threat. And we are also hearing that all is not well at Bui Power. It is therefore clear that Ghana's energy sector is in a state of crisis. As if that is not enough, the ECG, Gridco, and the Honorable Minister himself has been providing conflicting timelines on when this debilitating power crisis will be resolved. What is even more disturbing is that despite confirmation from Gridco a couple of weeks ago, that the country would continue to experience these power outages into the foreseeable future, for which reason they promised to publish a load management schedule. The anticipated schedule has been put on hold due to political pressure from the executive. Gridco is willing to publish that management schedule, but the executive has insisted that they do not publish that schedule. 
And so the ordinary Ghanaian is having to bear the brunt of these intermittent outages and these accompanying challenges with distraction to gadgets, whilst Gridco would have ordinarily published the schedule. It is a well-known fact, especially among energy sector industry players, that the current outages in the country is due to financial challenges and not the unconvincing reasons that we have been receiving from them. This is because the transmission lines and transformers are congested, and they are congested due to underinvestment and lack of regular maintenance arising from the poor financial health of the energy sector SOEs. Jennifer also outlined a series of recommendations, including a ban on the nomination of political appointees to sensitive positions at the Energy Ministry, he says, if adopted by government, would address the doomsday situation. We are not just criticizing. We are not just pointing faults. As a responsible minority committed to serving this country and poised to occupy the seat of government, we are providing alternative solutions, providing some pointers for government to consider. One. The energy sector players must be proactive and inform, that is publish, a schedule to electricity consumers who will be affected by these outages in advance so that would-be or affected customers can take remedial steps to mitigate the effect of such outages. Because if people know that their power is going to go off at a certain point in time, they may prepare so that their gadgets can be safeguarded. Two, we are of the view that government must cut down on wasteful and frivolous expenditure and inject that much needed capital into the power sector, especially for that of Gridco, to make up for the impaired revenue or cash flow of these utilities. Government must desist from political interference in the management of the energy sector. Consequently, we wish to caution government to refrain from engaging in political appointments within these utility companies, especially at middle management levels when vacancies are declared. We believe that at least, as for the middle management levels, when vacancies are declared, the top management should be empowered and should be allowed to go through this process. In VRA alone, more than 14 vacancies have been filled through these political maneuverings. Government and its communicators must also desist from engaging in the unnecessary propaganda of so-called excess capacity and come out with modalities and formulas for absorbing capacity charges as part of operating costs. Capacity charges will continue to be part of the energy sector because it is an insurance. That so-called excess capacity is only a false impression they are creating. Recently, just recently, the new minister did indicate that Ghana needed to start scaling up mm -hmm. on its generation capacity. So wherein lies the so-called excess capacity? Power sector players and managers must also ensure that they pursue long-term planning in order to ensure that we have full security for our generation assets at the least cost possible. Government must also allow independent power producers to take the responsibility for procuring their own fuel supplies and requirements. The issue where companies are hurriedly formed soon after the MPP government assumed office, and then the fuel supplies are hyped up for them, and they pay them under the guise of so-called capacity or to stop immediately. Immediate step must also be taken to aggressively address ECG's spiraling technical and commercial losses, currently estimated by its own workers at 34%. The New Patriotic Party can only win the next election if the Ministry of Agriculture is able to deliver on its mandate. According to statesman and founding member of the governing New Patriotic Party, Kwame Pienim, Dr. Ousu Kutuefriye asked the Minister for Agriculture to of the four pillars needed to break the jinx of ruling the country beyond two consecutive terms. Kwame Pieni added that the other two pillars that will help the MPP win the next election will be free SHS and ending corruption in the country. 
He was speaking at the Ria Kotu lectures organized by the Ghana School of Law. If the Minister for Agriculture, for Food and Agriculture, is able to mechanize and rejuvenate, rehabilitate agriculture to increase output and remove the yield deficit, everything we produce in Ghana will only attain 50% of the attainable world yield. Maize, rice, whatever, cocoa, name it. If it's able to improve and overcome that yield deficit, and the one district, one factory gets the output to process in the districts where the young people live and stay, they will be able to have good paying jobs to stay in the districts so that they don't come to the towns, Accra, Kumasi, to burden the already overtasked infra social infrastructure. Those are the two pillars. The other two pillars, free senior high school to improve the quality of our manpower for development. And the fourth one is stopping putting a stop to bribery and corruption that has been holding us back for all these years. So he's responsible for two. And if he's able to do that, we'll break the chains and we'll continue to establish what Bafu Akoto fought for. Well, the Chief Justice Kwesi Enin Yabwa, speaking through a Justice of the Court of Appeal, said Dani Sejai, is urging judges to be open-minded when interpreting the Constitution and not stick to technicalities. He also encouraged Ghanaians to remember their responsibilities to the Republic. The celebration of Akoto Memorial Lectures is to remind the courts not to be pedantic in dealing with the Constitution. And any application or interpretation of the Constitution which will impede its singular growth, which would impede its singular growth, must be avoided. By delivering the keynote address at the lecture, Minister for Agriculture and son of Bafo Akuto, in whose memory the lecture was held, Dr. Usu Akuto Efriye, expressed surprise that his father is not recognized for his role in the founding of the MPP and the development of politics in Ghana. In 1957, the government enacted the Avoidance of Discrimination Act. And the act said, an act to prohibit organizations using or engage in tribal, regional, racial, or religious propaganda to the detriment of any other community, or securing the election of persons on account of their tribal, regional, or religious affiliations, and for other purposes connected therein." Unquote. Leaders of the opposition parties realized that the prime aim of the law was to disband all political parties except the CPP and introduce a one-party rule in Ghana. Before the law could come into effect on the 31st of March, 1957, in his capacity as a founder of the NLM, Bafo chaired negotiations which convened the leadership of the other opposition parties to come together to form one party to be called the United Party. Given his, his strategic role in founding and leading the NLM, and in playing such a critical part in the negotiations for the formation of the United Party, the precursor of the NPP, it is, it is surprising that Bafo Akutu does not even get a mention in contemporary discussions on the history of our political tradition. And I'm glad to see uh, the regional chairman of the NPP here so that they can take the message back, the explanation back to the party. There is a gaping hole in contemporary discourse on his enormous contribution. That void must be filled by recognizing the strategic contribution he made in the political development of our tradition and of our dear nation. Uso Akutoifri also urged the citizenry to cultivate the virtues of his father, bravery and courage to help the country's development. The life and works of Bafo Sakuto and treat us all to cultivate 
the virtue of courage to banish elements that may jeopardize the progress of the nation. He did not wait for any sophisticated weapons to accomplish all these legacies. What he possessed were bravery, rhetorical and rhetorical competence, which underpins the importance of language and governance and cultural transmission. Everyone is endowed with some skills, ideas or knowledge with which they can achieve something remarkable. That he challenged the dictatorial tendencies of the times points to the innate quest of all individuals, regardless of their academic achievements, to fight for human dignity. In our time too, there are many areas that threaten our very lives and survival and the well-being of posterity. These include corruption of all forms, environmental degradation including the menacing galamse, the fast eroding values including discipline, care for humanity and neighborliness, which our forefathers bequeathed to us. Let us think and act in ways that would inure to the greater good of society, so that someday when we are no more like Bafo, society will consider it apt to continue our good works. Some travelers who touched down at the Kutkanti National Airport last weekend are raising questions about the authenticity of COVID-19 tests conducted on arriving passengers. Some of them who are currently in mandatory quarantine at Pantang say they have either been denied the opportunity to run a second test or see the results of the second PCR test. Some of them also say they have never received any medical attention since they checked into the facility and want government to investigate. I came from UK on um, Friday. I did my COVID test on Wednesday. I got my results on, fr on Thursday. I flew on Friday. I have two of my injections done. I took my injection on the 18th of um, March and another, another one 18th of April before I flew. I got here. They said, I've got COVID. They brought, I said, how? I brought with me a COVID kit because I'm coming to see my old lady because she wasn't well. So I, I came with self-assessed COVID kit, which they gave it to us at work because we had to test before we go to work every day. I tested in front of a nurse here. I was negative. I am devastated. I have only two weeks to come on a holiday. Now I don't know what I'm doing. I want at least... They, someone should be out there, a, a journalist, trying to investigate all what is going on. I couldn't believe that, that I have positive uh, even uh, before I, I came to Accra here. So we started to question them. I, for instance, I came from Germany. In Germany, the restriction is very, very high. And that week, I took the exams two times. And each time it was negative. I don't believe the credibility of the examination. No. <laughs> they didn't treat us well. I came with Turkish Airlines Saturday. They declared about 40 of us COVID. When we were going to join the bus, we didn't see almost 15 of them. And where are they? And when, before we were taking our luggage, you see somebody will come and said, you, have help, you need help for COVID. You need help for COVID. What is that help for? They said I'm COVID. Since Saturday, they never give me any medicine. Even this morning, when they were coming to take my pressure, the machine for temperature, they said there is no battery inside. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but if we have the COVID, treat as well. Nobody we know we know we are not sick. Everybody is healthy. I've been up to two hours. I did my test in Dubai and I got to Ghana and they said I had COVID. So I was kind of wondering, like, how, like, I don't know how possible it is. Well, it appears uh, they are not alone in this. The Secretary, Secretary General of, the, of AFTA, His Excellency Wamkele Mene, says he had a similar experience. It's contained in a statement issued by the Secretariat. It reads, a routine antigen test was performed on His Excellency Wamkele Mene at Kutugan International Airport upon his return from a mission outside the country. This antigen test returned COVID-19 positive result. Following the initial positive test result, His Excellency took precautionary steps and went into quarantine whilst receiving guidance and advice from his medical team. 
His medical team advised him to undergo further independent PCR tests. Consequently, His Excellency undertook two independent tests from two different private labs. Both independent PCR tests returned a negative result, clearing the Secretary General of COVID-19. It appears that the COVID-19 antigen test that was conducted at the airport produced a false positive result. In addition, it is worth noting that almost two weeks ago, His Excellency received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which should provide him with an additional measure of protection. His Excellency continues to adhere to all prescribed COVID-19 protocols. And that's a statement coming from the AFTA Secretariat. The government has uh, announced a ban on all exploration and prospecting for gold in forest reserves effective Friday, April 30. Also, all recon reconnaissance licenses granted by the Minerals Commission have been banned. Land and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abu Jinapo announced the new directives at Jubilee House Wednesday. Having the opportunity, I'll just seek to clarify just one or two things which are already in the public domain, which is that under the instructions of the President, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources is issued policy directives in respect of forest reserves. There's been a bit of confusion about it, and I thought this is a good occasion to clarify. The first directive the President got us to issue is that moving forward, the Forestry Commission shall not issue forest entry permits for purposes of mining in forest reserves. The process is such that the final permit one requires in order to be able to mine in a forest reserve is a forest entry permit. The President got us to issue this instruction, which says that no more issuance of forest entry permit. And so, as from I think about two weeks ago, there cannot be fresh mining in forest reserves. If you've had a mining lease, you've had a forest entry permit before this instruction was given, you are not affected. So the directive doesn't take you to active effect. But from now onwards, you, you, if you get a mining lease and you go to the Forestry Commission, the door is shut. So that's the first instruction that has been given. Is that the president took the view that prospect, people come for prospecting, recognizance, and or exploration licenses on the pretext that they want to go and explore for gold. And yet, proceed to mine. And therefore, he got us to also issue an instruction which says, as from Friday the 30th of this month, no prospecting, recognizance, and or exploration can take place in a forest reserve. So you cannot engage in prospecting, you cannot engage in exploration, you cannot engage in recognizance. Whether you have a license or not, you have to see. But just not, not just that. You are also to evacuate your equipment for purposes of exploration. The National Malaria Control Program has revealed that it will need about one billion US dollars to totally eradicate malaria from Ghana in the next five years. According to the epidemiologist at the NMCP, Dr. Nanaya Prepa, the program has been able to raise about 650 US dollars and they're looking forward to partnering with other stakeholders to achieve the target. There's more in the following report. Speaking at a press briefing to commemorate the 2021 World Malaria Day, Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwachi, called on all stakeholders to, as a matter of urgency, refocus and prioritize the zero malaria agenda to ensure a complete elimination of the disease. This team ultimately calls for prioritizing the malaria agenda, even in the midst of COVID, strengthening the collaboration among all sectors, and joining hands to ensure that nobody dies of malaria. Through press release, a media engagement, including social media, the public were sensitized on the need to come together and fight malaria in the country. Today, we have gathered here to highlight the status of malaria control program implementation and give opportunity to the media to interact to gain better understanding of the strategies activities, statistics of malaria control in the country, and also assisting how we can scale up our efforts. 
Epidemiologist at the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Nana Yaopepra, revealed that the program will need about one billion U.S. dollars to totally eradicate malaria from Ghana in the next five years. With our five years strategic plan, uh, we will need uh, uh, roughly around one billion U.S. dollars. Yes, yes, five years. And we've, we've been able to identify uh, roughly around 650 million U.S. dollars. Uh, meaning that we, sh we have about, say, roughly 400 more uh, to go. And we, what we have done as a program is to set up an advocacy team. The advocacy team is to ensure that uh, they put in all the strategies needed, document same, and uh, see how we can get the funds, especially domestically. Um, thank God that in this meeting today, EcoBank has pledged. And so we know that we will get more um, companies and institutions coming on board to ensure that we'll be able to raise the, the needed funds to implement all we have to implement towards the fight against malaria. Executive Director and Chief Finance Officer at EcoBank, Dr. Edward Botry, also revealed that EcoBank is set to launch a Zero Malaria Business Leaders Initiative to mobilize the private sector to support the fight against the disease. Indeed, I must say that being able to eliminate malaria would increase the prosperity across the African continent over the long term, fostering a healthier workforce, spurring on economic growth, and also reducing the cost burden that we have with malaria. We are therefore delighted to announce our plans to launch the Zero Malaria Business Leaders Initiative to fully mobilize the private sector to support efforts to eliminate malaria. The commemoration of the World Malaria Day, which was held at the EcoBank Head Office Auditorium, was under the theme, Zero Malaria, Draw the Line Against Malaria. We we'll take a break now to bring you more business news. You're hey, welcome to business. I'm Charles Aite. The General Secretary of the General Agri Workers Union, Edward Kaira, says the economy appears to look good on paper, but the figures do not reflect the reality. He was reacting to recently released GDP growth numbers, which shows agri sector contributing significantly to the marginal growth witness last year. Uh, good, but um, you see, because we don't actually eat figures, but we eat what is on the ground. When you look at the performance vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, GDP, it looks good. But when you go on the ground, that is a different story. And our focus should be what is on the ground rather than the figures. You know, when we go on the ground and the food situation is good, the people themselves who stated, you know, and that is what we should be looking at. We have over depended on figures and GDP for a long time that we now think that GDP figures per themselves uh, constitute a real uh, living standard for our people. It is not. The real living standard is measured on the ground. Well, that is an artificial one. But when you want to test the GDP, you go on the ground and test it. And when you go on the ground, it's a different story altogether. Now, the Chamber for Aquaculture is calling on government to waive taxes on the importation of raw materials used in producing feed for fishes. According to the its CEO, Jacob Adika, these high import taxes have increased the cost of production. Mr. Adika also urged governments to prioritize the health of fishes by instituting policies to safeguard the seas to boost yield. Challenges that are impeding the growth of the aquaculture sector. You know, for example, we have issues like high cost of production. That is directly linked to the cost of um, producing fish feed in the country. At the moment, feed manufacturers or producers pay some, you know, importers on some of the imported raw materials. What we should be looking at is providing some sort of importers waiver for those raw materials. And if they're able to do that, the effect is that it will trickle down all the way to the, the farmer because cost of feed will be less. It's going to encourage a lot of people to go into um, aquaculture production. And the other thing is we need to look at the fish health issues that's affecting aquaculture production. As um, you are aware, two years ago, we had massive fish kill as a result of the ISKNV virus that affected almost every farm. 
that in a way led to collapse of many farms, especially smallholder farms. The commercial farms, of course, are also struggling to bounce back. So if you focus a lot on um, fish health management, if you invest into this sector, we're going to diagnose disease on time, we're going to prevent outbreak of diseases on farms, and if you're able to control that, it means we are not going to witness any massive mortality. That means farmers at the end of the production cycle will have their fish to sell, get more money, continue to scale up the production, create more jobs, and contribute to national food security. Poultry farmers have been asked to add value to their chicken products to increase sales. According to the agricultural economist Isaac Nunu, selling specific parts of chicken will increase the profitability of poultry farmers in the country. Anissa Selwa Ajika has more on this report. Selling specific parts of chicken can give customers a wide range of choice. For a competitive edge, poultry farmers have been asked to explore opportunities in the poultry value chain. Isaac Nuno is a lecturer at the Department of Agricultural Economics, Agribusiness and Extension at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. They can add, actually add value to the, um, the, the poultry products so they can go into specific parts like it is imported that people they import their wings they import their thighs they import their breast and um, they import um, other parts of the poultry so i think they should uh, go into developing or like putting them into parts and selling if they're able to do that uh, there will be a bigger market for them people are trying to increase the level of consumption of the poultry products but they can't afford um, the whole like a whole um, ch um, chicken so they can afford the parts it can be the ties it can be the wings so therefore um, going into into sales of parts putting them into parts they can make some good money out of it they can also go into um, the processing of it into other things yeah. Speaking at a poultry youth mentorship and business boot camp, Mr. Nuno urged the youth to venture into poultry farming. The poultry industry has a very good potential, especially for the youth uh, to venture into it. Um, people have done it and succeeded, so therefore they can also do it and succeed. They just have to put across a good business plan, uh, have to learn about um, the business take mentorship from those who have experience in it and take the bold step into it and they, will, they are good to go. They can make a good business out of it. Yeah. The poultry mentorship program has opened economic opportunities for young graduates. It is organized by the United States Department of Agriculture under the Ghana Poultry Project. Anita Sewa Ajoga reporting. And also we have a summary of international business news.
And that'll be it for business. Sports start next. Many thanks for joining me for Sports here on Joy News Prime. And the Ghana Embassy in Egypt is demanding over 330,000 US dollars from the Ministry of Youth and Sports for pre-financing the accommodation of supporters flown to the North African country um, for the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations. Joy Sports has linked. Here's more um, from my colleague Muftao Nabil Abdullahi. The Sports Ministry in 2019 revealed over $1.4 million dollars was spent on accommodation during Ghana's participation in the tournament. It is unclear how much of that money was spent to accommodate the over 500 supporters flown to support the Black Stars. However, the Ghanaian Embassy in Egypt is demanding $332,000 from the Ministry for funding their stay of some supporters in the country. Joy Sports understands that the current Sports Ministry is unaware of the debt as there was no breakdown of expenditure in the handing over notes presented by former Minister Isaac Isiama. The Ministry, therefore, will audit the accounts before concluding on whether to pay the supposed debt. Sources tell George Sports that the ministry has a debt of 20 million Ghana cities, of which about 5 million was accrued from the last Afghan in Egypt. The notable chunk, however, is the $332,000 demanded by the embassy. Other debts from the Afghan 2019 have to do with some travel and tour agencies who have all demanded various sums of monies from the ministry. The Confederation of African Football gave the Ghana FA about $600,000 for the Black Stars' preparation and participation in the tournament. But the Sports Ministry in September 2019 wrote to the association, which was then under normalization, to demand 50% of the money. The football governing money under the leadership of Dr. Kofi Amwa transferred $300,000 to the ministry as requested. The ministry directed the GFA to use the rest of the money to pay clubs that participated in the NC special competitions. Now, the Ghana Rugby Players Association Grupa have petitioned the board of the rugby union to force its president, Herbert Mensah, to step down within 72 hours. The petition is signed by Grupa president Akko Wilson and Secretary General Abdul Nasir Meizongo, an address to the board on April 23, was also sent to the National Sports Authority, Ministry of Youth and Sports and the Ghana Olympic Committee. There is more in the following report. The petition, signed by the Association President Akko Wilson and Secretary General Abdul Nasir Meizongo, and addressed to the board on April 23, was also sent to the National Sports Authority, the Ministry of Youth and Sports, and the Ghana Olympic Committee. In the nine-point petition available to Joy Sports, Herbert Mensah has been accused, among other things, of dictatorship, conflict of interest, and disregard for state agencies. The association says the former Asante Kodako chief executive officer has single-handedly fought and expelled six local coaches who together have more than 40 years of coaching experience. He has boasted of being the person who has the final say on who makes it to the national team selections. Most of these coaches refused his incessant interference in making a team which led to him expelling them from the Ghana rugby without recourse to the board. He has replaced them with foreign coaches for easy control to the detriment of the future of Ghana rugby. Mr. Mensah has also been accused of imposing family and friends in the control of Ghana rugby. They claim he uses players as workers in his house. Any player who refuses to continue working in his house is automatically expelled from Ghana Rugby. They claim the president on countless occasions has referred to the National Sports Authority and the Ministry of Sports as filled with a bunch of useless persons who have no idea about running sports. It is in this regard that he has had collisions with all the ministers of sports and the directors of the NSA over the years. They have demanded that Herbert Mensah resigns from his position within the next 72 hours. And we'll bring you a reaction from Mr. Herbert Mensah's camp tomorrow. But before I go, President Nanado Dankwa Kofado has appealed to corporate Ghana to raise funds to support the senior nationality in the Black Stars to enable them to prepare for the upcoming continental and global tournament at a fundraising breakfast meeting held at the Jubilee House on Monday. President Akufuado said the Black Stars need financial support to end a 39 year Afcon Trophy drought and president um, of the Ghana Badminton Association, Evans Yebo, has also called um, for tax rebates for companies who will make financial contributions. 
uh, it would be good for the government to start rethinking and looking at a tax rebate policy for these particular uh, corporate sponsorships that they bring on board. Because, uh, yes, we all know, yes, they are doing something to support Madagana, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a bottom line result. So what are they getting back? And if it's looking at the least finance sector, $25 million could be able to solve the challenges that they have due to equipment, uh, infrastructure is being taken care of, and be able to attend international tournaments, which at the end of the day, gives us the needed laurels as economy. And basically, it also has a socioeconomic impact as well. So the government should also be looking at introducing a tax policy uh, rebate so that if company A is donating a, you know, $1 million to support uh, Ghana badminton, Basically, he has, uh, in some other countries like he's done, he's got a waiver of his corporate tax or there is some initiative of a tax element that he gets at the end of the day. So it's a win-win situation and that's how we must look at it. And a quick update from the UEFA Champions League. Manchester City have turned it on its head. They lead PSG by two goals to one. Two away goals certainly is a very good position for Pep Guardiola and his charges to be in. And they were down by a goal to nil in the first half, but they've come into the second half stronger. And it looks as if they are going to be having their noses in front um, ahead of the second leg. And of course, there'll be more later at 10.30 p.m. here on Fun Zone. Do join me. My name is Hans Mensando. I'll wrap up the bulletin here. Join you, Prime. My name is Israel. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.